Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 536 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Stephen Knoll, and today is the 19th of September, 2019. Okay, before we get too far, you guys know that you love to watch the show, you love to listen to what we say, you love the guests we have on the show, but you have an opportunity here to help. And you can do that by sharing us. So if you could click on the share button there on Facebook or YouTube, if you want to participate in the show, the show continues right after uh, this thing goes to credits. You go to the comments and add your comments, ask questions, and continue the conversation. If you haven't subscribed to Anglican TV yet, what's your problem? What are you waiting for? Now's your chance. You go to the YouTube, there's that little subscribe button. It's a red rectangle. Click on it. A bell is going to come up. Click on the bell and it will instantly notify you the next time I publish a show. I have Stephen Noll on. Stephen Noll and I are going to talk about three or four different topics. We have lots of fun when we have on the program. I think the first thing we need to talk about, uh, according to the internet, and uh, all that's going on is Article 13 and uh, other considerations of the Jerusalem Declaration because people are saying, well, it's a perfect document, almost. Why aren't more people signing on to it, especially in the Church of England? So what do you think? <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. I've written a series of three posts uh, called Thoughts on the Jerusalem Declaration, on my own blog, which is contendinganglican.org. And I was a participant in all three conferences uh, of GAFCON, including the one in 2008, uh, where we drafted the Jerusalem Declaration. And I think many people have recognized that that's really a pretty fundamental statement of what the GAFCON movement stands for. And, um, but I also think it needs to be explained, exegeted. So in my posts, I took on three topics. Uh, one of them was, is GAFCON a church? And my conclusion was that the, the Jerusalem Declaration and the statement in which it is found actually is setting the, the form of a church, or perhaps better, a communion of churches. So it's not just a statement of a ginger group, as uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury would say it, nor uh, is it a statement of um, just a, an interest group, for instance, like EFAC. Um, but it is, in fact, setting out the parameters of a church uh, through its uh, 14 clauses. So that's, that was the first point I was making in my first thought. My second thought raised the question, can the Jerusalem Declaration be added to? And I suggested that while formularies, that is, significant documents, should not lightly be changed, in fact, almost all the major formularies, including what we call the Nicene Creed, have been amended over time, as were the 39 articles. Uh, they started as the 42 articles, as was the Book, Book of Common Prayer. So my conclusion is yes. At times, it may be necessary or useful to amend a document. And in this case, I would like to add a pro-life clause to the Jerusalem Declaration. I was a member of the uh, statement group. We looked at some of the major issues where I would say the church needs to speak prophetically, and we just missed that one. So, yeah, well, the Jerusalem Declaration was kind of response to everything going on in the Episcopal Church, and a desire to stay within the formularies of Anglicanism. Yes. Um, and it did that really well as a document. That's true. But we did address specific issues, for instance, sexuality in the family. We addressed mission, the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. And we addressed stewardship, issues uh, of stewardship of the earth. So there was that attempt to speak out into the contemporary issues that may not have been the major issues in the 16th century, but are today. And that's where I felt, unfortunately, in the rush and whatever, we simply did miss what is a major issue, which is when does life begin? And so this was the proposal that I'm actually 
offering, and I'm, it, it may well be changed if it ever reaches any floor, it says, we acknowledge God as the Lord of life and death. Ultimately, he gives and he takes away. We support and hail the efforts of physicians and the fruits of medical research when their work promotes the natural processes of life and death. But abortion, euthanasia, intentional suicide, transgender modification, and genetic engineering are affronts to God's sovereignty and human dignity in God's image. Well, you can see that covers a lot of the contemporary issues in our culture, and I think also in the church. So I'm putting that forward. It, it certainly would not ever be considered for another few years, if that. But at least in principle, I'm saying the Jerusalem Declaration can be uh, modified uh, to address uh, issues and circumstances that arise. Now, can this only be modified at a GAFCON conference, or can it be done by the primates? No, no. I believe uh, the, the Jerusalem Declaration itself was uh, aff affirmed by the entire assembly in 2008. So the uh, GAFCON assemblies happen every five years. So there was the one in, in Jerusalem, Nairobi, and then the latest one in Jerusalem. The earliest that anything like this would ever uh, make it to the floor would be 2023, I think. And, of course, it would be vetted by uh, the primates and other you know, the theologians before it ever got to that stage. Now, ironically, on the Internet, some of the Church of England clergy that I follow complain about Article 13. Yes, well... And Article... Right. Well, uh, yeah. well, explain... Right. Let, tell people what Article 13 is. Right. Because it, yeah. right. Well, that's my third one was, okay, if you can add to the Jerusalem Declaration, can you subtract? And uh, so uh, the way I put it is uh, the Jerusalem Declaration has 14 clauses, um, and they're largely affirmative of what we believe in, but there's one of them that's a downer, and that's Clause 13. And Clause 13 reads this way. We reject the authority of those churches and leaders who have denied the Orthodox faith in word and deed. We pray for them and call on them to repent and return to the Lord. That's Clause 13. So in a recent discussion with uh, some friends in England, uh, who are supportive of GAFCON in general, they said, well, we, we really love the Jerusalem Declaration and all of its affirmations. And I said, well, does that include Clause 13? And they said, well, uh, not so much. Uh, and in fact, um, there was one or more bishops in the Church of England who decided not to attend <coughs> GAFCON 2018 because they felt that they could not affirm Clause 13, which was expected. I mean, that is, all attendees were expected to endorse the Jerusalem Declaration. In, and in full. Whole. Yeah, sure. So it is a problem. And so what I did in this uh, third one is to look over that issue. And um, first of all, to put it in the context that GAFCON is actually affirming the ecumenical unity of the church. If you go back, and I'm not going to read them all, but Clause 11 says we're committed to the unity of those who know and love Christ and to building authentic ecumenical relationships. Clause 12, the next one says, we celebrate the God-given diversity uh, which enriches our global fellowship, and we acknowledge freedom in secondary matters. We pledge to work together to seek the mind of Christ on issues that divide us. So GAFCON isn't just being negative and, and snipping away with scissors. It's, it's putting this Clause 13 in the context of a, uh, an orthodox uh, communion with um, a liberal spirit for matters that are secondary. But there are matters that are primary. And that's the point where Clause 13 says we reject the authority, not only of those teachings, but of those who teach them. And that's where the real rub is. Many people would say, oh, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of Lambeth 110 and the, you know, the sexuality against the sexuality movement, but I, I can't go against my bishop or I can't go against my priest or whatever. And Clause 13 is saying that those who are shepherds in the, in the church, in the communion, actually have a responsibility 
to go against those who are teaching false uh, doctrine. At GAFCON 1, there was an opening video with Ron Williams, you know, saying, hi, you know, I'm glad you guys are meeting, but it was kind of clueless as to what you guys are really doing. Mm -hmm. GAFCON 2, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin uh, Welby, flies into uh, Kenya, shows up, and uh, gives a couple sermons at the Eucharist. Again, kind of clueless to what you guys are really doing, uh, but interested to find out what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, GAFCON 3, by this time, the Church of England has largely crashed. Mm -hmm. Dual integrity, uh, dual... Uh, I forget what it's called, but you know all the things that were set in place to protect conservatives and orthodox and all that has failed, and it has gone really liberal in the leadership and the deaneries mm -hmm. of the uh, cathedrals, the clergy, and the laity. Their ASA is ridiculous. I don't think at GAFCON one you foresaw how bad the Church of England would turn out. Well, I can only speak for myself. Having seen that uh, slippery slope in the Episcopal Church over 20 years or so, I could see the same forces at work. And I do remember even talking immediately after uh, uh, GAFCON 1, when I was in Uganda, we had a meeting there, including <clears throat> a number of people from the Church of England. And uh, I pointed out, the parallels, and they said, it, it'll never happen here. And, you know, I said, lots of luck. Uh, but I think, in fact, it has, because the same forces, and in some ways, the secular forces in, in uh, the UK are, are, are even worse than the secular forces here in the States. And the church is trying to sort of do this balancing act um, with, uh, you know, the government and the, the society. Well, the church, the church of England would say, hey, we never changed our doctrine. But that slippery slope has happened. You know, where it's just, it's a wink and a nod, what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, you contacted me after we did an episode uh, with Gavin, George, and I, where we talked about whether or not the devil was a real entity, a real person. And um, you said, you know, Kevin, I wrote a book. <laughs> okay. Uh, about angels and demons, and uh, you, you know, I thought this is a great opportunity to address this from the Anglican teaching of is there really a guy named Lucifer, <laughs> and are there really angels named uh, Michael? And I thought if we could have a little fun discussion about that, and then we're going to talk about seminaries because that's the latest topic this oh, week. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, um, so believe it or not, I'm one of the um, uh, angelologists in the Anglican tradition. And I wrote a book here um, 20 years ago called Angels of Light, Powers of Darkness. You can still get it from Amazon. Um, and it was an attempt to write a biblical theology of angels. And um, a, little bit of, a little bit of background, interesting. Um, I did my doctoral thesis on the angelology of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, really? That okay. really makes me very exotic. Yeah. Um, but I then, when I began to teach at the seminary level, began to think about what we call biblical theology. How do you integrate all the different things that happen in the, the heavenly world or even the world below into one biblical theology? And uh, so I began working on the biblical passages all the way from the Old Testament, like from Genesis 1 or 2 or 3, all the way through, obviously, the book of Revelation. And I found you can't just talk about angels alone. You also need to talk about fallen angels. You also need to talk about what I call principalities and powers. Correct. And I think there is actually a difference between those three, but all of them are real uh, supernatural beings or entities. And I guess when we talk about the devil, I think I can simply say that I think the Bible is clear that Satan is a, a personal being. An entity. It's fair to call him a fallen angel. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and therefore, once you do that, 
you come to a very different understanding from a lot of under, other understandings of evil as a kind of abstract force or, uh, or you know, dark and absence of absence of good, which was sort of Augustine's idea. No, I think we're talking about an, an actual uh, metaphysical being who is um, at work to undermine the work of God. Well, of course, just he's just to, being, yeah. just a simple reading of the narration found in the Temptation of Christ finds an entity, a person of the devil, uh, interacting with Jesus. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is, <clears throat> one of the things that a lot of Old Testament scholars say is that Satan doesn't appear in the Old Testament. Maybe just a momentary occasion, Book of Job, and that's mm -hmm. about it. But I would argue that, number one, if he is a an immortal being, then he's got to be around from the beginning to the end. <laughs> but it is true that he's sort of hidden. I think what happens in the, in the desert with Jesus is when the Son of God comes, he flushes Satan out. You know, C.S. Lewis was very clear that Satan would like as much as possible to work behind the scenes. He'd like the world to work behind our fallen desires. He'd like to work behind the, the, the temptations of the world. He doesn't want to come out in person and be seen as he is. But when Jesus comes and is anointed Son of God, it forces Satan's hand. And so from then on, Satan becomes a major uh, actor. Uh, in the book of Revelation, I'm just going one step further, chapter 12, it talks about this great dragon in, in, in heaven, and that's clearly Satan. And it's when the woman, I think the people of God, the church, gives birth to uh, a son it forces the, the dragon to come down from heaven to try to kill him. And then it says, well, the, 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 the boy, the son, was t snatched up into heaven, but then the, the, then the uh, dragon continued to pursue his offspring throughout the world. So I think what we see is, on one hand, Satan is defeated. He's cast down to the earth. But over the short term, it's actually bad news for us on earth and for the church because defeated though he is, he still uh, is pursuing uh, you know, God's creatures and, and trying to corrupt them and destroy them. Yeah, so, it's, I mean, that is the uh, narrative I understand. And so, and have been taught. And it, you know, it makes uh, uh, perfect sense. Now, angels. So the, the Bible has more uh, um, encouraging literal uh, introduction with angels than it does with uh, clearly uh, Satan. What do you think about that? Yes, because God is good, <laughs> and uh, God has created you know the vast the you know the as we say in the Anglican liturgy that in all the company of heaven that glorify his name, singing holy, holy, holy. I mean, mm -hmm. there's this vast uh, army, host, of God's faithful angels, uh, the one text called the elect angels, who remain utterly faithful to him throughout all eternity. It's this little minority group that revolted from the very beginning and essentially is being uh, uh, held in, in, in chains until the day of judgment. But nevertheless, they exercise power power in this world. On the other hand, the good angels also are at work as messengers, uh, as protectors. I will say, when I wrote the book, uh, Kevin, I, I decided, as a biblical scholar, I wouldn't try to collect stories of people who have met angels. But the fact <laughs> is, they're all over the place. Sure. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that, you know, looking from a biblical point of view, there are kind of two categories in which people meet angels, I think. One of them is what I call an aura or a light, where people have a sense of, the, of a presence. It could be a presence of God, it could be a presence of Jesus, or it could be the presence of an angel. Sometimes they don't even know. But sometimes people, for instance, in a hospital, you know, or at the point of death, have this sort of you know mystical sense of, of a presence. And I think that's one form of angel appearance. The other is what I call road angels. 
Uh, and if you look in the Bible, very often people seem to meet angels while they're walking along the road. Um, and I've read quite a few accounts in, in our day and age. It's not so much road angels as automobile angels. But I, I've read a number of accounts of people uh, who have been, you know, in the, almost ready to crash, head-on crash, or, or where they've had a tire in the middle of nowhere and somebody walks up and fixes it and then they look around and the person's gone. Well, you can doubt any one of those cases, but the fact is that is a fairly frequent um, uh, experience uh, that, that people have of meeting, meeting angels. All right, we're going to move on to our next topic. Okay. A lot of people don't know this about you. Uh, I just learned it about you. Um, you're a Berkeley boy. <laughs> That's where you went to seminary. Now, looking at you, you people think you made it 20 years ago you went to seminary. Uh, it was a little while ago. Tell us about your seminary. Well, of course, I've had to cut off my long locks and uh, <laughs> my beads and all the other things. Now, by the time I went to Berkeley uh, in the 60s, 1968, um, it was in full fling, but I was uh, not interested at the time, although... <laughs> We sat through the People's Park riots and mm -hmm. uh, various other other things. Uh, but needless to say, there was all sorts of crazy things. You see, I was a new convert. I only became a Christian when I was uh, my junior year in college. Okay. So I'd only been a Christian really for about two years when I showed up in Berkeley. I do remember, you know, heading into my theology class, and the professor who had actually studied under Rudolf Bultmann announced that um, really? wow. that, he, that he had. Uh, concluded that God is dead, you know, to which I replied, wait a minute, I just discovered he was alive. Now you're telling me he's dead. <laughs> so there were, there were lots of crazy things uh, going on, um, as, as there are today, um, like at Union Seminary. <laughs> well, EDS and Union have merged, and mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's making news here on Anglican TV and Anglican Scripted, and they put a, a Twitter post out the other day uh, about having a plant liturgy and confessing to the plants for all the bad things they have done to plants. And I <laughs> probably smoking a plant is a bad thing, I guess. Yeah. And so I like, you know, uh, seminary can be a crazy place. I, I've had clergy who've gone to good seminaries uh, and bad seminaries tell me some weird stories about seminary, about professors who, you know, well, you have to take his class, but don't believe what he tells you. Mm. Well, no, we don't, we don't uh, find that a Trinity uh, or Neshota or uh, RAC, but... My, my crazy story, um, uh, which is that um, I grew up as a uh, Unitarian for a while until I dropped out of the Unitarian Sunday School. And when I was in Berkeley, um, there was a... a, a, a a seminary there, Unitarian Seminary, called Star King Theological Seminary. And uh, uh, that was the Unitarian Seminary. So I just thought, well, I'll just drop by and see what their morning worship looks like. Well, when I got there, uh, there was a whole chorus line of seminarians doing leapfrogs over one another. Uh, and, you know, they asked me to join in, and I politely said, I think not this morning, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but it was a little funny because Unitarians you know, historically have always been rather cerebral. Uh, you know, I don't believe in more than one God, you know, sort of thing. And Jesus was a great man who taught wonderful things. But by this time, it had become quite you know, uh, radical. <clears throat> However, I'd say on the other hand, uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific uh, had some very good professors. I mean, actually, one of my professors was a Massey Shepherd who was involved in revising uh, the, the liturgy in, 19, in the 1970s. And I actually don't think it's a bad liturgy, though I'm very happy to have a new one with the ACNA. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe even more important uh, was a, an Old Testament professor named Francis Anderson. He had studied uh, with a famous um, archaeologist named W.F. Albright. And, um, uh, and Frank knew about 25 languages including Old Church Slavonic. I discovered that later. Wow. And he taught me Hebrew, and he taught me to love the Bible because he was not actually an Australian evangelical. Well, I was in, uh, just going to finish the story, I was in Sydney uh, for the primates meeting in April, and I, 
it turns out that Frank Anderson is still alive at age 92. And so I, I took the uh, opportunity to go down and visit him, and it was a wonderful time. And interestingly, although he's 92 and somewhat feeble, he's still very interested in the Bible. He wrote a little commentary on Job in the Tyndale series, and he's revising it now, so I've been working through it. So I would say, although there were a lot of crazy things about an Episcopal seminary in the, in the 60s, I actually had several good mentors that, that helped me through. Yeah, I have friends who went to Yale uh, in the 70s and 80s, and they've got great stories about, you know, wonderful professors and, you know, get, getting early on, but, you know, then it went bad. Some of, my, some of my former students will kind of smile at this point because I was always seen as promoting the canonical approach of Brevard Childs, you know, who was at sure. Yale, Yale University for yeah. uh, many, many years, and I think was one of the great you know, uh, Old Testament, well, biblical scholars really of our time. All right, so we want the audience to continue the conversation. I would say 99.99% of our audience is clerically inclined and has gone to seminary. So if you could, in the comments, give us your crazy seminary story. That'd be a lot of fun to read. Stephen, I want to thank you for your time. You've been watching Anglican Unscripted, episode 536.